And you know what? Just for our friends that are worshiping with us online, I'm going to stand over here, but y'all can have a seat right there, okay? And CJ, you put something in the box for us today, right? Do you have a clue for us to make us guess? It's blue. Huh? It's blue. It's blue? That's a good clue. What do you think? It's, it's a race car. It's not a race car. Okay? It's blue. Go ahead, church, guess. <laughs> what? A smurf. Is it a smurf? Nope. I don't know. He has no idea what that is. <laughs> Can you give us another clue? It has his name on the bottom. It has his Huh? It has his name on the what? On the bottle. On the bottle. No. The bottle. Yeah. Has his name on Can I peek? Yeah, okay. This is the blue stuff. Ah! It is blue. It does have his name on the bottom. Hold on. I love this. You youth of the beach, what do you think it is? Shovel. Shovel, it's literally coming. A out. shovel, and what else? What goes with a shovel? Bucket. A bucket. That's shovel right. Shovel is literally coming out. I love it. And right here. Right there. Oh, what's right there? The destination did. Destination on earth, the truth about Jesus, Jeremiah twenty nine thirteen. That's yours? Did you get this from PBS at the Baptist Church? Yes. Yeah? So first of all, church, let me say one thing, okay? We do not have different Jesuses. We all worship the same one. So when another church does great, we do great because we're all part of the same family. about is digging deep into the question. Sometimes we don't often say these kinds of things, even though we act like we know the answer. Who is Jesus? God. He's God, okay. And Jesus. He's the same. Hmm. All right, well, what else, church? Who is Jesus? What do you think? Did Jesus die on the cross for our sins? So he's our Savior. Did he raise back to, back to life three days later? Ah, so he defeated death for us, right? In the Bible, does he teach us lots of things? So he's like a teacher to us. Does he help us know that we are loved and special? That then he's like a friend or a dad, or an But, you know, church, one of the things that, that is important, and I, I haven't checked out this curriculum for BBS this year, even though it looks like a good one. One of the things I think we need to do sometimes is we need to answer some very basic questions that we all say, yeah, I know the answer to that, but what is it? Who is Jesus? Dig deeper. Well, what does it mean to have a relationship with him? What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be loved by God? What does it mean to have an eternal salvation? Here's a really fun, easy one, okay? What's one of your favorite stories from the Bible? Go ahead. Um, I've seen the two bottles. The two bottles. The two bottles? Bottles. Jacob and Esau. Oh, two brothers, Jacob and Esau. Thank you, I'm sorry. Thank you, Jacob and Esau. Yeah, I like this. sharing this with us today, that's our challenge, church, to dig deeper within our own faith. Don't just take things at face value and see if you can understand and express 
Not just what you believe, but why you believe it. Can we pray together? All right, pray after me if you would. Dear God, we thank you for sending Jesus to die for our sins, to teach us, to love us, and to walk with us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good job. All right, thanks, buddy. Y'all go have a seat. If you all got your Bibles, grab it with me. And we are going to be heading over to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 14. Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 14. 
And by the way, over the next few weeks, we're going to actually be spending some time in this area for a while. Okay, I'll explain why in just a little bit. But listen to this. From Ephesians 6, 10 to 14, from the Word of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, and with the breastplate of righteousness in place. The word of God for you, the people of God. So as I shared a little bit earlier, um, we just started BBS this last week. And if you were here last week, you know that, that we talked about the fact that over these next five weeks, we're actually going to be joining our, our children and exploring something very similar, a similar theme to what they're going through uh, during BBS. And we're doing so for, for two reasons. One reason is that the fellowship hall is already decked out, so why not use it, right? But the other and more important reason is because as, as spiritual leaders, we want to take this opportunity to literally walk side by side with these young people. We, we want to explore the Word of God along with them. We want to be able to be spiritually prepared and equipped um, to, to share with them some of these things. We want to be fresh upon our hearts. And so over these next five weeks, we're actually going to be joining them on this spiritual journey. We're going to walk alongside them as these young people start to explore what is called the armor of God. And now, as a part of this, something fun that we're just going to do is I want you to keep an eye out on our worship space. Because over the next five weeks, we're actually going to be building a sculpture together. As we take week by week and add one more element on, there's going to be one more element added to our sculpture. And so this first week, we literally have the belt of truth right there. I don't know if you can see it from far back, but the word truth is engraved in gold letters upon it. And here's kind of my hope. Not only do I think this is kind of fun, I like to do arts and stuff, um, but, but my hope is that, that perhaps even if you've heard this many times over, over these next five weeks, you're going to hear things about the culture, about the people, about theological concepts you've never thought of before that make you go, wow, that makes complete sense. Stuff that would just set your heart on fire and help you come that much closer to God and get excited for these young people and for the Word of God ourselves. Now, one of the first things you need to understand is that Paul is writing this letter to the people in the city of Ephesus. That's the name of the book, Ephesians. Okay? And, and he's writing this letter to a brand new, very young church. That, that, that it's just started out. So he wants to write them a letter of guidance, strength. It's a very pastoral letter, a very sermon-like letter, uh, almost like a fatherly kind of influence to it. And he's actually writing this letter while he's in prison. Paul has been in prison for preaching the good news about Jesus Christ. And so it's amazing, first of all, that while he's there, his thought is not just upon himself, but he's sitting there thinking, what can I do to encourage this new church? And so he starts writing a letter. And some scholars believe that what happens is he's sitting there and he's trying to grapple with, how do I help them understand spiritual warfare? How do I help them understand with the, the schemes of the evil one, as our scripture says? Okay? That moment right there, how do you deal with spiritual warfare? And so as all this is buzzing around his brain, some scholars believe that what happened is he looks out of his cell and he sees a Roman soldier standing there in full guard. And he says, I got it. And he starts writing, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. 
Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. He goes on to say that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities of this dark world, against the, the, the authorities of the heavenly worlds. And right there, some people can take issue with some concern because he just said, our battle is not against flesh and blood, it's against the rulers and authorities of this world. Well, is our battle against people or not, right? What's he talking about here? But, but again, what you need to understand is we need to begin to grasp the city of Ephesus itself to really understand this better. And this was interesting to me. Ephesus was considered to be the spiritual center of the ancient world at this time. As they had many pagan gods, some of the primary temples for the major gods was in the city of Ephesus. As a matter of fact, some pilgrimages there all the time to worship these pagan deities. Now, what's interesting is you need to understand how pagan worship, this pagan worship, and many others, how it really works. Okay? You, you would go to these temples and you would offer everything from prayers to sacrifices to alms, all this kind of stuff, but you do it so that the gods would pay attention to you. They don't need you, nor do they want you. If you want to get their attention, you have to give them something they want. Okay? You're trying to appease or even that you don't want the gods to become angry at you and harm you. Okay? Pagan worship is based on fear. I'm not going to get enough. They're not going to do enough for me. I better do this. I better do that. Just to make sure I get enough. But what, what, what happens if I don't do this? What happens if I don't do that? Pagan But what starts out in this is, is, is it's interesting because in, in, in Ephesus, uh, again, some scholars believe that there was such an influence, such a heavy concept that, that the gods were in charge of every tiny detail of life, almost to the point you actually don't have free will. You don't choose things. It's chosen for you. That, that there was this common phrase that started developing around the city of Ephesus. They started calling the gods the authorities and rulers. And so when Paul says our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the authorities, against the rulers of this dark world, what he's doing is he's saying, look, our battle is not against people. It's against evil itself. And this is important for us to hear on multiple levels. One is so that we understand that, no, he's not telling us that government is e evil, okay? Nor is he saying that the devil owns all governments in the world, okay? evil is happening, what sin is. I mean, the scriptures tell us we are to love all and it uses this word, hate, sin. Somehow in our world, and our culture, we've forgotten this old Sunday school lesson I learned as a kid. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Sometimes we can act like in order to love the sinner, we must forget about the sin. Or in order to hate the sin, we must pretend that the sinner is not doing it. No, 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 no. I this is the calling upon our lives. 
And, and we're going to get deeper into this introduction section as the weeks go on, okay? But, but what's interesting here is that as it goes on, um, Paul tells us after this introduction session, he says, after you've done everything to It's like he's saying, look, after, after you've been beaten down by the devil, after you've been destroyed by the world, after you feel like all hope is gone, after you're tired and you're hungry and you're just stressed out and, and you don't even know which way is up and you feel like your world is inside out, you don't even know what you believe or think anymore, stand firm then. Don't give up. That's not the moment to give in. When you feel like you're overwhelmed with temptation, and it's just like, I, I just, it would be so easy just to give into this and get this suffering over with. Stand from them. And it's interesting because what Paul says is he says, the first thing I want you to do in that moment, I, I'm a quantifiable person. Don't tell me what to do, tell me how to do it so I can do it. Okay? Stand from them. Great. Okay, sounds good. How? Paul says, okay, I'll tell you how. The first thing I want you to do is I want you to take truth itself and buckle it around you like a belt. It, not like this. Okay? They didn't use it to keep their pants up. They didn't wear pants. Um, sometimes they would use it to gather up their clothing, but that wasn't its primary purpose. As a matter of fact, they didn't even wear it on their waist. A Roman soldier had a strap of leather about yay wide, and he'd wear it across his stomach, okay? The reason why it was there to actually protect the stomach. You couldn't have your breastplate go down all the way here. You wouldn't be able to bend over. So this leather strap was there to protect the stomach and the kidneys and everything else. Y'all, Paul is basically saying to us, you need to wrap truth around you so it can protect your gut. You need to cover yourself, like putting on a belt with truth, so it can protect your core. Who you are in the deepest part by wrapping truth around you. And you've heard just as much as I have, oh, everybody has their own truth. Your truth may not be my truth, and vice versa. No, that's called opinion. Okay? Truth is truth is truth is truth. Whatever you against me, it doesn't change truth. We talk about the pitfalls of this world all the time. Just because you rationalize away the railing, it doesn't move the cliff you fall over. Okay? Truth is truth, and anything else is called opinion. And so, for me, I need something. I need to ask the big question. Again, I'm a quantifiable person. What is truth? How do I define truth? What's the line in the sand for me? How do I stop? How do I say, this is it, no more? For me, for Curtis, as a follower of the one true high God, this is truth. That's it. At times, there may be moments when, when there may be parts of it that confuse me. There, there may be parts of it where I say, there's even a part of me that doesn't like that. There's even a little part of me that doesn't agree with something that's said in there, that doesn't change this. I do not change the word, the word changes me. This is truth. And that's the end of the line. Anything beyond that, I make God into what I want him to be, not the other way around. So I need to start by saying, look, no matter how crazy, how, how complicated the world gets, no, no matter when, I'm not even sure what I think anymore, or what I believe, I need to stop and say, okay, who am I at my core? I need to wrap this around me. What is truth? What does the word say? This is truth to me. And the, the other thing you need to understand what a belt does, specifically for a Roman soldier, is, is a Roman soldier that they put this girdle like thing on, okay? You ever see somebody do weightlifting? They put this stain on them. And why do they put it on them? To protect their back. 
because they're going to lift some heavy stuff. The truth supports their spine. All right? These Roman soldiers, they're not just wearing, as I said before, the breastplate. They're wearing a helmet, a shield, a sword. You know, they got armor all over them. They got to lug it around all day long, but they don't have air conditioning. Man, their backs would have to be killing them by the end of the day. The belt doesn't just protect their gut. It doesn't just protect their core. It supports their backbone. It gives them strength that they didn't know that they could have. Longer when at other times they would just be defeated and give up. Yo, this is what truth does for us. And so, again, we need to ask the question, what is truth? And again, we need to make the choice for ourselves and say, this is how I define truth. I cannot define it by what the world does. We've talked about this tons of times in here before. That, that, that truth, according to the world, is whoever can be offended the loudest today. Right? If you can be offended louder than me, then the world calls you truthful. That's what the truth is. But tomorrow, if I can be more hurt than you, more angry than you, or more loud than you, then the world changes its morality. That's what truth is. No, I need something that's beyond humanity. I need something that's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I don't want shifting sand underneath my feet. I want a solid stone to stand upon. Okay? I do not want to be blown about by every wind of teaching, as the scriptures say, or being lukewarm water that... that God tells us in Revelation, if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. I want nothing to do with you. No, I need a truth that's bigger than humanity. I need truth that even if I don't always understand it, even if I know always there's small parts of it I don't agree with, even if there's parts of it that, that, that are hard, uncomfortable, and I really don't want to do, it doesn't change it from being truth. That's what I need in my life. I need something where I can say, I serve the one true high king. I serve something that's beyond humanity. Something that's smarter than I am. I need something greater. And here's the watch up part. This is the point where we need to be careful. Because we can't forget that a belt is not a weapon. Regardless of when my uncle used one to whoop me with one. Okay? And I deserve it. A belt is armor. A weapon is there to destroy, to attack with. Truth is not a weapon to destroy and attack others with. It's armor. It's there to keep you safe. It's there to protect your gut when you don't even know if you're going to make it through this one. It's there to give you a backbone so you can stand up straight when at other times you would have been stooping over. To give you a spine. To stand up for what's right, stand against injustice, but it is not a weapon. So when you have times when you disagree with somebody and you feel like it is important and needed to share the truth, do it. But seek to hold that sacred, beautiful balance of valuing and loving all as made in the image of God. In other words, when you have to speak a hard truth into somebody else, say it, and only say it once. Don't come back and keep saying it over and over again. Respect their ability to have their own brain. They heard you the first time. Anything you say after that that's repeating yourself just drives them farther and farther away from you and more to an emotional state. Okay? You say it once, you move on, and what you do is you're respecting their ability to choose for themselves. If you want them to respect you, you got to respect them. At the end of the day, I can't change what other people think. I can't change what you do with whatever I say. As far as I know, this may just be something interesting for you to do on Sundays and you go out of here and you ignore me. That's not up to me to decide. I can't choose what people do in our own churches, in other parts of the world. I can't choose what happens in this city. But what I can say is that for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Because I will seek to put that around me. Me. Hold on to me. Just last week, I was talking with a, a pastor friend of mine. She's a pastor in the Anglican church. She was in Egypt recently. And um, I hesitate a little bit to share 
the story, but I'm gonna do it anyways. Um, she was in Egypt, she was wearing her clerical collar. She goes into a shop. You know, what you doing here, da da da. And, and she explains and says, yeah, I'm from the Anglican church. And he goes, oh, you're the people that hate guineas. And she goes, no, that, that's, that's not it. We love all people. All people are welcome in our church. This is just how we understand and, and, and apparently, after all that, he, he says, you know, we in the Jewish community, we have a saying. It's very Jewish to say it, because we have an old phrase. <laughs> find your own rabbi. In other words, if you don't like what this one says, go over here and find another one. Find somebody that agrees with you. Y'all, that's not worshiping God. That's not this change in the Methodist Church came up, and I kid you not, he said, oh, I really just haven't given it much thought. There are some Christians where there's this new common phrase that's starting to develop among them, and it's breaking my heart, but I'm, I'm hearing this. I'm hearing this not just at the, at the basic level, but in every branch of different denominational theological standing. And they're using either this phrase or one very similar to it. The scripture contains truth. The problem is, if the scripture only contains truth, that means it's allowed to contain something else. Right? No, the scripture is true. That's it. Because when it can contain something else besides truth, all of a sudden I get to let us say what I want. I can say, oh, this part's more important than that part. I like this one more than that. I don't want to offend these people. I don't want to do this. I don't want... No, even if I don't like it, even if it makes me uncomfortable, even if it's hard for me to grasp, this is true. It is not shifting sand. It is not... Does it involve the miraculous actions of our Savior? Yeah. Does it involve His commands, salvation, how to go about our lives? You betcha the Bible is true. And, and honestly, not everybody agrees with my stance on this, about how I approach the Bible. And you know what? If you don't, that's okay. I want you to wrestle with this. I want you all to sometimes disagree with me. If I don't push you and make you uncomfortable sometimes, I'm not doing a good job. Okay? But all I can say is this. If you want to talk with me about anything I've said here or beyond, come talk with me. I want to be wrong sometimes because if I demand that I'm always right, then I am no longer being taught by God. I'm trying to tell God what to do. I want to hear from you, and I want you to hear from me, and I want you to make up your own mind about it. Whatever comes out of this space, here's the bottom line. As for me and my house, we see this as truth. And the way that we seek to move forward and defend ourselves and understand it and not use it as a weapon is to follow what Paul says here. And we start by buckling up around our waist and saying it protects who we are, our core on the inside. It gives me a spine. It strengthens my backbone. But it is there to be used as armor, not a weapon. Y'all pray with me. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for your word that radically transforms us and changes us. Lord, I, I humbly ask that you continue to grow us and strengthen us and guide us through your word every day. Teach us what it looks like in times of confusion and unsureness and fear to buckle the belt of truth around our waist, to protect that of you which is in us at our core and to help us to stand strong. Lord, we pray for your guidance. We pray for your wisdom. We pray that you teach us how to love all and worship one. We pray, Lord, that everything we do here, that we leave this place, we take it with us, and you mold it into what you want. We offer this in Christ's name.
So my friends, if I may be so bold to say this, may you choose this day whom you serve, and may it be the Lord Jesus. May you define truth by the word of God that goes beyond humanity. May you buckle that around you to keep the core of who you are safe and to help you to stand tall when things weigh heavy upon you. And may you receive that as your mission and your blessing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.